I hadn't slept because I was traveling. And then I show up at the hostel where all the other speakers are. And Kura Shrad, who's from Halifax, he's like, let's just let's just ride to the lecture. So I put my computer and my briefcase in this bicycle. They had bicycles. At the, there's, there's, yeah, there's Kurush. Um, and the two of us are just riding. And we were actually riding side by side and having a full conversation. And I just thought, you know, I got to capture this. And so this is the two of us. And we rode to the lecture that way. Uh, this is actually, this is a phenomenal video here of us riding through the middle of rush hour. So this is what rush hour looks like in Amsterdam, folks. And we're on the bike trail. It's absolute chaos. But notice no one gets hit by that moped. Um, and there's people crossing the path. It's not all grade separated and all that stuff. Watch this one guy come out. Not, not this, right before he gets on the next bike trail or bike ramp there. There's somebody that comes from the right of the screen um, and just like cuts them off. Yeah, yeah. Um, right there, bam. But but because you know it's because you're human and you're like all you can see these people coming in. You, you, it's just not a big deal. Like there's no there's no road rage going on. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman, and that is Joe Minicosi with Urban Three out of Asheville, North Carolina. And welcome to the first episode of season seven of the Active Towns podcast. Uh, so wonderful to have you along for the ride, and much appreciated. Uh, Joe and I are going to be talking about the financial modeling that his firm does, uh, that really kind of brings home what it means to help have a healthy, vibrant economy. Uh, both like physically, public health wise, and you know, activity wise, as well as financially. So let's get right to it with Joe Minicosi. Joe Minicosi, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks, Sean. I've been looking forward to this. This is going to be fun. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, I have to apologize. For what? It's taken me so long to get you on the podcast. I've been That's wanting right. to do this for a couple of years. And now you have all this cool equipment. <laughs> I do. <laughs> we were just talking about that before we hit record. It's it's a slippery slope. Next thing you know, you've got an entire studio set up. <laughs> I'm very jealous. Yeah. And for those at home, it's 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 a whole nother world when you get into this. Of all the lighting and everything else. It's you can you can geek out pretty hard on this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it, it truly is a slippery slope. Uh, hey, many of the folks who are tuning in, listening to this as well as watching this, uh, know who you are, but I guarantee you there's a few of my fans that are like, Joe Minicosi? Who's Joe Minicosi? <laughs> so, Joe, who is Joe Minicosi? How do I say it? What's the elevator pitch? Well, um, I mean, I, I, God, our work is explaining the financial side of cities and the economics of how cities flow. That's what we're known for, that and crazy computer graphics showing the, the financial flow of cities. Um, but how I got into this, um, I'm actually trained as an architect and went to University of Miami uh, back in the 80s. And that's where Duane Plater's Zyberg were kind of doing a lot of their early work, what would now be called new urbanism. And for me, coming from the Rust Belt and going to South Florida and seeing rapid city growth was kind of mind-blowing to me. And they were just trying to alter that course of how do you just design better cities as they're growing? But for me, it was an economic question. My town was designed well, but as dead as a doornail. So what are the choices that were made there that made that happen? I ended up going into real estate finance and then real estate development. I worked in city government for a little bit and got to see all the different pieces of city making, but all of them had a common economic strain. They were just looking at it from a different angles each way. So for a city, you want to grow your tax base. For a developer, you've got to pay for stuff. For the financial world, you're investing in certain types of buildings to give you a return on investment. But we're not looking at it as a common economic um, marriage, if you will. So our, our work kind of puts it all on a paper like that. And that's kind of how we explain it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, and in fact, uh, Urban3, of course, is the name of your organization. Uh, that you were just referencing and uh, you know, we, we could see it. We, yeah, go ahead. You know, people sometimes ask like, why the three? And I'm like, well, it's, it's because it was supposed to be urban cubed because the urban environment is a three dimensional space. Think of a public common or a public square. It's like basically an outside room. It's got walls, but uh, I had a really hard time convincing getting my IRS paperwork done 
to have a superscript three. So I was just uh, like, whatever, screw it. It's just three. Urban three. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll get, we'll can, get into the, we'll win get so in, many wars. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And we're going to get into the three dimensional aspect of it in just a, a, a little bit, but I, I did want to point out that, you know, behind you, and if I solo you out here, we are able to see strong towns as the strong towns book there from Chuck uh, is, is prominently located there. And that's how you and I know each other is from seeing you and from your relationship with Chuck uh, Marone with uh, Strong Towns. And the two of you uh, tag team on a lot of different projects and have tag teamed on a lot of different uh, really impactful presentations throughout the years. Talk a little bit about that, you know, I don't want to call it a marriage, but I mean that 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 partnership that you all have had over the years, because it's a great one-two punch to, to listen to the original presentation, the curbside chat, and then your presentation that drives home this three-dimensional modeling. Yeah, there's, um, you know, in working... God, I got to go back to like 2009. I was still working with public interest projects here in Asheville. We're actually, I'm actually still sitting in their office right now. And one of the things I had seen, the director of public interest projects, his name is Pat Whalen. He was doing this amazing presentation on the, it was, it was sort of like the quintessential case, the economic and environmental case for urbanism. It was a, a brilliant PowerPoint. It was super dense. I mean, this thing is like, this would crush you. And he's in there winning an argument. So the urban compact cities are way more economically productive, but they're also ridiculously environmentally productive. It's, it's counterintuitive for a lot of folks that we tend to think, well, well, hey, Joe, there's a lot of buildings and not a lot of open space. It's like, yeah, if, if you can save the open space, not have a road go further out and compact in and just do your trip with a walk. Okay, well, what's your sacrifice? You don't have a yard. Okay, it's not going to kill you to not have a yard. I mean, there's, I mean, lots of your viewers live in European cities or dense cities um, where you're able to, to walk. And it's like, yes, it is a downside to not have a yard. I have a yard in my backyard. But on the flip side, what do you get as a community benefit out of it? So Pat was doing this presentation. In 2009, I went to the Smart Growth Conference in Seattle and did a whole PowerPoint presentation. I think the, the first slide was a quote from Mark Twain that said, a person who won't read has no advantage over one who can't read, right? So let, just think about that for a second. A person who won't read has no advantage over one who can't read. So I have all these books back here, but if I choose not to read them, I'm functionally illiterate. So I, ha I had my hand in the air and I asked all of our peers you know, peers that are interested in smart growth, folks that are interested in active transportation, walkability, affordable housing. I had my hand in the air and I said, okay, so who's read your local tax code to see how your property tax system works? And John, you know, we hang out with a bunch of nerds. I was expecting like a couple of people to raise their hands. I'm a guy that likes to look at pictures. I don't like to read. And, and, and I'm just, you know, I'm an architect and not a single person raised their hand. And I was like, what the hell? Like, no one's reading the tax system. It's basically the world that's out there is created because of what's the path of least resistance. We're essentially subsidizing sprawl. Right. So I was kind of blown away and I was talking with Peter Katz. And he's like, you should go to a CNU. And I was like, well, the CNU are sort of like, it's, it's my tribe. It's your tribe. It's like, we get it. Like, I'm not going to go preach this stuff to the people who get it. And he's like, no, but you're entertaining. Just do it. So I, I got stuck on a panel with Chuck. And I didn't know Chuck. I'd never met Chuck, but I saw that little cartoon that he did with the little rabbits talking about the transportation engineer thing. And it's brilliant. If nobody's ever seen it, please watch that. Just watch the short version. It's four minutes. And it's hilarious if you've ever had a conversation with a transportation engineer. Yeah. And so I, I walk up to Chuck and he actually had a little, little voice recorder thing. He goes, do you mind if I record this? And I was like, no, that's fine. I just want a copy of it so I can hear how I present. And, um, he does his presentation and it just blew my mind. It was a whole the growth Ponzi scheme thing. It was all about the cost. What's the cost of roads? Things aren't paying for their costs. More of the, the, the negative side of things. I was more of the positive side of where's the money come from. It's your downtown. Maybe you should work on your downtown. And, you know, it was, I, I jokingly call it when chocolate meets peanut butter. It was sort of like, he was talking about one side of the argument. I was talking about the other, but together it made sense. And from then, like, wow, that was 2010, Madison, uh, Wisconsin, CNU. 
uh, we started doing a lot of road shows together and I called it the shock and awe campaign where Chuck would roll out with his presentation and just, I mean, literally destroy the audience. You, you watch people's brains explode when Chuck, Chuck presents because he pulls the curtain backs in an unfarnished way. So you could see the reality of how screwed up things are. And my side was more, I mean, we have high tech images, a lot of fancy graphics. It's very awe inspiring, but it's helping people see their community in new ways and see the positive reinforcement of doing a downtown. So that's a long story, but that's kind of yeah. how you found it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, this is. So, so I, I'm glad you mentioned this. This is from 13 years ago. Literally. So 13 years ago. Uh, and for those of you who uh, have never watched this, it, it's tremendous. This is the short version. This is the four minute version that you you referenced. There's also an eight minute version. And that's the other book is Conversations uh, um, of a Recovering Transportation Engineer. Uh, I have an entire interview with Chuck uh, uh, introducing that book. And so I'll also include that link in the show notes for this episode and also this video. I want to play just a, a few seconds of this so that you, sure, can, sure. Yeah. you can get a sense as to what we're talking about here. And and Chuck laughs because it's just like, it, it's he just put it together really, really quickly. And, and it just came naturally because he's he was this guy. He was the engineer having this conversation with you know, a, a, a homeowner, somebody in the community. For the road to be safe, all obstacles must be removed from the clear zone. Do you understand that my children play in this clear zone? I would not recommend that. It would not be safe. But it is safe today. I thought you were doing this project to improve safety. How is the street more safe if my children can't go outside? Building the street. <laughs> it so, goes yeah, on and on and on like that. I mean, there's... It, it, it's hard to describe the brilliance of that video. I mean, you really have to watch it. Um, and there's several things going on. One is the comedy of the lack of communication. Um, and, you know, and, and Chuck goes through it at length in this book. And if for anybody is trying to fix a street or, or deal with changing your environment, you're going to run into this problem. You're going to run into an engineer just like this. Now, here's the thing, though. Read that book because it's not just the engineer. You're going to run into it. This is where I, my world. I run into it with assessors where we show assessors how their, their math is not, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And they're so trapped by the silo of their trade of their systems. And it's, that's, that's systemic bias. You're going to see this with your planning director. You're going to see this with your finance officer, people develop biases. And when you put information in their face or question it, you're going to get a fight. And this has been the whole history of the new urbanism. I think back to the early nineties, just talking about architects doing zoning codes, the planners flip their lids. They're like, you're not planners. You can't do this. Well, here now, 35 years later, we have form-based codes in cities because it makes sense. But yeah, systemic bias is the biggest problem for any of us doing anything in our communities. Yeah. And, you know, there was there was recently a post, uh, I think it was by Stefan Baer, who um, is an American who is living uh, in the Netherlands now. He actually works for the city of, of Harlem. And he uh, put a post out on LinkedIn earlier this week talking about this very thing of how in the Netherlands, uh, the professional engineers, they have no degrees. They have no you know, initials behind their name. There's no licensing and there's none of this. And, and, and he talks about how that's liberating because in, in the United States and many other countries, these experts are like, they, they have these fiefdoms and they're very, very protective of that. And that's, that's kind of sort of like what you're talking about is they, they consider themselves experts to the point where they have nothing to learn by having a conversation with a community member like in this cartoon. Yeah. And I, I'd say, I mean, I've seen, I've seen the downside of that. Mm -hmm. Assessors don't have the same background that, that I have. They don't go through a planning program. Right. But this is, this is a screenshot of the assessor training. Right. And they're being trained in the same four colors. Let's see if I can get this right. The same four colors as red line. You know, they don't, here we are in 2022, redlining was deemed illegal in 1968. And they don't understand that that's a bad thing that they're practicing redlining today. You know, so it's like, it, 
I think there's a curiosity, there's a community, there's a shared community value in the Netherlands about we're all in it together that we don't have in our country. And it's the American myth of we're all independent, we're all on our own freedom. And it's like, okay, that inspires a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. When you have to live in a city, you can't really pull that off with this independent thinking that way. Yeah. There's, there's actually a a Dutch term for that as well. And Stefan does uh, refer to that in his post. I will be sure to include that post uh, from LinkedIn in, in the show notes uh, for this episode and also the video below. I do have the uh, Congress for New Urbanism uh, website up just real real quickly since we've been talking so much about it. For those of you who are watching this or listening to this, if you're not already aware of the Congress for New Ur- Urbanism, cnu.org is the, uh, the website. We will be coming together once again for the annual gathering this year for 2024. It will be in Cincinnati. Uh, and again, it's, it is sort of a coming together of individuals that are coming in from diverse backgrounds and diverse fields. Uh, you know, I'm one of the few public health guys that is there year after year after year consistently. It's not like I'm the only public health guy ever to attend. You know, Dr. Dick Jackson has been there a few times, uh, but I'm one of the consistent public health dudes that are there that are constantly talking about how the built environment has a profound impact on our health and well-being and encouraging what I'm passionate about, which is active living which is something we're going to be talking about today is, is that this, all this stuff that we're talking about, when we look at what you, the work that you all are doing and looking at a prosperous community and a healthy community financially, I look at this and say, yeah, this is consistent with what I talk about in terms of building a healthy community for public health too. Yeah. And also Chuck's going to have, he had it last year. He'll have it again in Cincinnati. There's, if you want to come a day early, he has sort yes. of like the, uh, activist boot camp um, with the Strong Towns Gathering beforehand. Yes. Yeah, it'll be the Strong Towns National Gathering, and you are absolutely right. Um, it's going to be the couple days beforehand. It was it was super fun. I sat on a panel along with uh, Mike uh, Pasternak, who we, you were just referencing earlier before we uh, hit the, the play button, um, on a panel of content creators and you know podcasters and YouTube channel uh, content creators, and so that was really fun to be a part of the Strong Towns a national gathering what what i like about <clears throat> well both groups are great it's like paired they pair well together uh, like a great cheese and wine but um the, the congress for new urbanism is sort of you know for me it's I've, I've been around them since since the early 90s a lot of my architecture professors were founders of the, of the movement i get it um you know i see what it's about it's but when i talk to people about it, i'm like it's sort of like the island of misfit toys like you find these people that, that wander in from all of these varied, and you, you, you nailed it, like all of these diverse fields where they're all seeing there's problems with cities and they're all trying to unpack it. You know, and I think what's, what's, what's fun about it as a, as a conference is it's, it's very active. I mean, there's people, like there's gaps between sessions of like a full half hour with people arguing in the hallway. I mean, it's just people come in and try to figure out how they can, hone their arguments or learn new aspects. So you'll find that all of this cross pollination that, you know, from, for us helping designers talk through the economic side of it and the value of urbanism to help you explain that, yes, you're not just trying to get people on bicycles 24 seven, you're trying to get people to understand the cost and consequences of the other modalities of transportation that we're subsidizing. So it's like, did, did we really choose I mean, seriously, anybody read what listening to this podcast, go back in the history of your city and find that city council meeting where they did a vote to spend billions of dollars in automobile infrastructure. You know, and so that's that's what we bought into. I think that people make decisions based off emotional choice. Like I want to be more conven- I want to have more convenience. I should be able to park anywhere. Okay. Well, did anybody tell those people? that it's going to cost billions of dollars. Would you rather have billions of dollars go to cars or would you rather billions of dollars go to, I don't know, teach every child how to be a road scholar. You know, it's like you could, you could make these choices and, and active living or that's choices. Right. So. Well, and it's interesting too. It's interesting too, because, you know, Chuck talks a lot about um, 
in in that first book, um, he he he. Oh, I'm going to solo you out so we can have that first yeah, book yeah. Uh, in frame there. Strong towns. Uh, in the first book, he really talks about the fact that um, that really the suburban experiment was just this. I mean, a lot of the people, you know, that were really the movers and drivers and the people making the decision, because you're pointing out, nobody asked the the community members, is this really what you want? Um, Some of the community members, you know, uh, ended up making it a market choice, but that choice was really not a fair choice because it, it, as time went by, it was like the only thing available that was really to them. So they had one choice and that choice was suburban sprawl. <laughs> yeah. And, and, well, you know, or, so. I mean, okay. Sorry to everybody in the audience on this one, but let me pull out another book here. Just a second. Yeah. This is depressing. This is a, <laughs> a book from the 1970s. And what does that say? Yeah. The cost of sprawl right there. Boom. This is this is from HUD, the EPA, yeah, and CEQA, which is yeah. the Environmental Quality or whatever. Um, yeah, and so that's is, literally like that's that's a government book from the yes. from the federal government from the Nixon yeah. administration. This is right. from 1973, and it's all anybody wants to nerd out. It's all data on 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 the cost and consequences of this choice. So let that wash over you for a second. So you and I remember the, the, the gas crisis of the early seventies right. and how we had to all queue up and with like, based on your license plate and whether or not you could get gas. Remember that? And so yeah. oh, here's yeah, the federal totally. government stepping in and going, Hey, Hey kids, you made bad choices. Right. You know, so our, our federal government is trying to explain to us. And even when we got the data, we chose to keep on doing the same stupid behavior. So, back to human back to human health yeah i like eating pizza i really do i'm sure you like eating pizza we can't eat pizza every single day of our lives we would have heart attacks especially if we're not exercising so there are choices and consequences and what you see with the american city is it's been pizza for 80 years yeah and and there are costs to that so but humans it is um, humans. Now you you have been, you know, like Chuck, you have been in demand. People want to hear your message because A, it really forces them to to look at things in a different way. Um you you sent this photo over and and I'm like, yes, I can tell just by the angle of this, you're on a bike. What's the story behind this photo? <laughs> Uh, there's actually a lot of stories. This is, this is just after the Louisville CNU, I was asked to speak in Amsterdam. And anyway, it's like, there's a lot going on here. For one, my bag gets lost. I got delayed in, in Newark. I show up in Amsterdam without a suitcase. And here's what's kind of cool in the air, in the uh, train terminal in, in downtown Amsterdam, I bought a suit. So all, all that's European clothes. I've, I've, I've even had to buy a new underwear, like a whole thing, like all that. I hadn't slept because I was traveling and then I show up at the hostel where all the other speakers are and Kura Shrad, who's from Halifax, he's like, let's just, let's just ride to the lecture. So I put my computer and my briefcase in this bicycle. They had bicycles. At the, there's, there's, yeah, there's Kurush. Um, and the two of us are just riding and we were actually riding side by side and having a full conversation. And I just thought, you know, I got to capture this. And so this is the two of us. I had to like get behind him and he's, you know, he's, commenting and we rode to the lecture that way uh, this is actually this is a phenomenal video here of us riding through there's my briefcase um riding through the middle of rush hour so this is what rush hour looks like in amsterdam folks and we're on the bike trail it's absolute chaos but notice no one gets hit by that moped um and there's people crossing the path it's not all grade separated and all of that stuff um watch this one guy come out not not this right before he gets on the next bike trail our bike ramp there. There's somebody that comes from the right of the screen um, and just like cuts them off um, right there. Bam. But, but because, you know, it's because you're human and you're like all, you can see these people coming in. You, you, it's just not a big deal. Like there's no, there's no road rage going on. Yeah. And he, and he's actually, he, he's actually, uh, you know, pointing to and talking about oh yeah the bike parking, the parking. Look at all so that bikes. i'm going to turn the volume up so we can hear what he says 
we can talk about this. How many parking lots do you see for these many bikes? I know, isn't it crazy? <laughs> It is. It is crazy, and it's crazy to think about. Um, yeah, that'd be like two two football fields worth of parking easily. Yeah, yeah. and the update to to that particular facility is that um, they now have underground parking for in upwards of eleven thousand bikes. And uh, this is a little video that a friend of mine shot uh, of the first segment. This is the first seven thousand bikes. Um, you know, in the underground, underwater, because this is this one here, I think, is is the one that's underwater in the harbor there. Um, again, imagine if we were trying to provide parking at the train, the central train station, and we were trying to provide parking for for automobiles. It just doesn't pencil out. Well, and the thing about that is, OK, each of those bikes and they're stacked um it's not all that hard to stack a bike you know you don't need you don't need massive elevator equipment and all of that you don't need pneumatic machines but a, a car is typically going to take about 350 square feet yep you know i remember earlier in my profession it kind of dawned on me i was sitting in a cubicle in an office and i was like well how much space is dedicated to me for eight hours while i'm sitting in my office and it ain't 350 square feet. So my car has more space dedicated to it than, than I do. Again, these are choices and consequences. So is it what's a net benefit for those thousands of bikes underwater? And it's going to be expensive. I mean, I'm not going to say that's the cheapest solution. Yeah, there's all that just random. I mean, it's just part of their culture. They just. Well, I would even I would even go so far as to say that it's not just that it's it's quote unquote part of their culture because a lot of times that's used as an excuse to not do uh, things is that because their built environment is now such that it supports that behavior and really promotes and encourages it 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 does sort of reinforce that there is that natural inclination so there's a whole stratification of different things and it, it's something that I talk about a lot in terms of hey, we can have this too. We can create a culture of activity. We can create a culture of active mobility, but not unless we build that into our cities. In other words, those meaningful destinations need to be within walking and biking distance. We need to have the an overlap of mobility networks, including the ability to walk, bike, use transit, as well as drive, to be able to, to really make this sing the way that they have. Certainly. And, and also they started, to be fair, they started in the seventies doing this stuff. So, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. We didn't get into this problem in two years, you know, so it's, 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 it's taken decades to build this inequitous system and it's going to, it shouldn't take decades to get out of it, but we do need to understand how to get there. So like in our, in our work, we're just, we just, it's kind of like visually showing somebody a balance sheet and saying, here's where you're going broke. That's you can, if you if you want to keep doing that and doing the wrong thing, we're not going to stop you. But we want to make sure that everybody sees it. So, um, and for the for the folks just listening to this as a podcast, I mean, there's a lot of visuals that that we have. I'll, I'm going to I want to show you a couple um, in this and maybe how we tell the story. Um, but you know, if, I mean, John, you 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 come from a medical world. I don't. So you, I'm actually like a novice. Um, a, human study or I don't know what you call it, like observationalist, but, but mostly it's trying to empathize with the audience and realize that nobody's ever explained this to us before. So like even that Richard Nixon document, it's unbelievably boring. It's awful to try to work your way through. So, and this is for everybody back to, back to the, the engineer thing. Um, I can't tell you how many professionals of mine and, and seriously, like listen to yourself, any advocate that's listening to this, listen to yourself, talk to a regular person. And if they don't understand what you're talking about, they're not going to like say, Oh, I'm, I'm stupid. They're just going to think that you're some nerd that's like way too passionate and they're going to tune you out. So how do you communicate to a regular person? How do you let someone in on what you've learned? And a lot of that takes some humility of understanding the audience. I think that's, Chuck's success is in just 
plain speaking it. He's not political. It's just here's the information, and it's it's understandable. I think that the curbside chat is the is the quint, quintessential um, way of handling it. It's just let's just meet at the curb and chat about this. Right. That conversation re- requires active listening and engagement. Um, I just yeah, show a picture. And- and and basically, we're we're looking at this particular image on screen right now, and we'll d- describe it for those just listening into this. And the the title of it is "Communities Are Leaking Money," and there's a bucket that has a bunch of holes on it, and water is squirting out of it. And the image that comes to mind is going back to the curbside chat that uh, you know of Chuck's original presentation is him getting that epiphany that. As, as that suburban uh, model and the horizontal expansion went further and further out, he was realizing, especially as you start doing what you were talking about, which is start looking at the tax rolls and you're like, holy moly, we are actually going broke as cities because you're not able to tax enough to be able to sustain the infrastructure of being able to support the horizontal expansion that has taken place. And visually that's the beauty of of what your work and what you you guys do and and that's where this image here where you see the spikiness and and you know when we look at this these numbers are related to money that comes in yeah so let me turn it over to you and let you you talk a little bit more and try to describe that yeah, I think one of the things, I mean, back to that bucket metaphor, what, what you find is that people want to throw more more water in the bucket. So we need to get more revenues. We need to, and, and they don't think through, is that water that comes in it, one, is it going to stay in the bucket or is it even going to be positive? So in a lot of communities, what they'll do is they'll just start annexing more land and getting more housing, which means more tax base, which is great. But what does it cost to service those communities? Well, which is what we did for decades. And that's why cities yeah. became amoebas. That's why, you know, I'm living in, yeah. in Austin, Texas. Austin, you know, is currently 326 square miles, which is absolutely ridiculous. It really should be divided up into, you know, four cities, <laughs> you know, based on that size. Yeah. You want to see Austin? Let's do it. I mean, yeah, let's just see Austin. So, I mean, this is super old. This is almost 10 years old now. Okay. So, so I apologize for the quality of, of these slides, but uh, because it, it is old, um, but this is, this is Austin. What I like to tell people is it's sort of like, think of it as like an economic brain scan. Like if, if I can show you a picture of your brain, why can't we show you a picture of economics? So here's, Here's Travis County in total value. So this is how people typically talk about real estate. Think miles per tank, right? So gray is non-taxable. Green is low value. Purple is high value. So you have some properties that are over $190 million, probably way more now uh, because this is 10 years ago. But you see these, these, you know, like, like a doctor reading a CAT scan, you can see these hot spots right here along the highway. Well, to be fair, those are huge parcels. So this is, you know, we don't talk about cars on a miles per tank basis for efficiency, do we? So why do we do that with real estate? So rather than total value, here's value per acre. And the map changes and you see this heat shift here. Right. And one of the things, one of the things I realized is people can't read maps or, you know, it just, they just don't see them associatively. So we're just like, let's just take it to the third dimension. The other thing is if you just look at the scale, People have a bias in the way that they read information that they're like, oh, orange to purple, whatever. It's just a change there. But you're not going to remember those numbers or understand the context. So here it is. And here it is in 3D. Can you tell where downtown Austin is? You know, so if everybody's paying the same Travis County millage rate, right? So you are a Travis County taxpayer. So one of the reasons why we always go full county is because you're paying county taxes. When the county's receiving all of those property taxes, are they putting it back into the city where it's coming from? And the answer is no. Oftentimes that goes to county infrastructure, which basically rewards them to keep on sprawling out too, right? So you see all of this low value as you head out of Austin. So yeah, you, yeah, you mentioned Austin is big, but Austin is really that much. So what about all the rest of it? So let's go back for a second. Look at all this stuff out here that's not part of Austin. Who's covering all of that infrastructure? That infrastructure is literally the twice the size of the footprint of Austin. All those county roads out there and 
are they paying for it or is Austin paying for it? That's a question that should be in your head. And again, it's just don't hate the player, hate the game. People need to understand the game in order to play it though. So this is why we do that data. Zooming into just Austin itself. Yeah, so Travis County needs to be all over throwing love at Austin because that money's just being shoveled out in spades out there. Um, you can see the spine and you're right. There should be, if, if this is Mount Everest here in downtown, you should have some foothills around. Actually, you know what? Now that we're talking, I'll show you an example of that. This will give you an idea of the, the change of our quality. So this is Springfield, Missouri. One of the things that you can see going on is there's downtown right here. It's going to zoom in. So you've got downtown right there, but you can see that there's this, what used to be a whole different city called North Springfield. They've been kind of glommed together, but it's, it has its own little main street going on up here. So yeah, you don't have to be downtown to create value. You can have little baby downtowns, uh, but you can see there's suburban sprawl on the South side. It's just kind of oozed its way on down. And on the North side, it's sort of stunted. Um, it was kind of, it was kind of interesting to talk with them about the growth pattern. And again, it's like, we tend to accept our city as this is, you know, somebody's been planning this, there's decision makers making these decisions. And the reality of it is, is there's a decision that happens, but then this kind of, we get on like sort of a treadmill where life goes on and we don't necessarily reevaluate that decision. So when I was showing this to them and you, you could see the suburban sprawl at the city edge, there's a lot more of it on the South side down here out in the County. You see that? Yeah. For some, re for some reason, they annexed way the hell out here, but whatever. I mean, we see weird things all the time. But notice on the north side, there's no growth over on the north side. Well, why is that? Well, if you go back and look at their red line map, so these were made illegal in 1968. Green is good. So green got mortgages. Blue probably got mortgages. Yellow it was a little bit more difficult, and red was not. Red was, it was really difficult to get. One is to get a mortgage, but also get it securitized under the F FDIC. Yeah. So, Joe, you may be getting to this, but just in case you're not getting to this, um, define what redlining is. Okay. So people call these maps redline maps, but they're known as the Home HOLC, Homeowners Loan Corporation. So the federal government in 1934 changed mortgages. So mortgages went from seven years to 30 years. Let me see if I can do this on the camera properly. There we go. In 30 years. So that was a huge jump in mortgages, right? We tend today, if you just talk to your friend at like a cocktail party and you're like, do you, could you imagine a time with seven-year mortgages? Like they would think of you like a Martian. We just assume we've always had 30-year mortgages. It's like, no, the federal government changed that in 1934 because we were in the middle of the depression and they're trying to get people into single family homes because single family homes create more labor because- you got four walls as opposed to a multifamily project where you don't, right? So it's you create more stuff. If we create more stuff, we get more people employed. I mean, it's kind of brilliant. But the federal government stepped in and said, we understand there's risk because of the economy. So we're going to go ahead and absorb that into the mortgages and protect it. But we can't control everybody's decisions. So what we're going to do is let you control that with these maps. So you may you pick the neighborhoods that are good investments. You pick the neighborhoods that are bad investments hazardous was you were deemed hazardous by two main characteristics, whether there was an infiltration of immigrants. And in the 1930s, the number one immigrant class were Italians. So people like me, watch out. I could take down your real estate value. I'm hazardous, right? So that's, 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 that's class number one. Coming in at number two in the immigrant class were Germans. Well, guess what kind of Germans were coming into the United States in the 1930s? Those were Jews fleeing Germany. So it was, that's the immigrant class. The other, the third, the third group was, was black population or in their language, Negroes. So here's the problem. I mean, there's lots of problems, but at a simple level, I can change my name to Smith. There were, there were Italian neighborhoods that were sometimes classified yellows because there were you know, Italians that came a generation before that. But if you were black, you can't change the color of your skin. So the perniciousness of this for, from 1934 to 1968, this went on three generations. So notice on the north side, it's all, this is, this is downtown right here. This little, the white square right there. The whole north side is pretty much deemed undesirable. 
So it didn't receive all that capital. You couldn't get a mo- home mortgage loan. You couldn't get a, you couldn't do a home repair loan or anything like that. You just were extracted from the economic system. On the south side, it's like, oh, hey, you're awesome. I think one of these neighborhoods was deemed white men capitalists live there, and that was what qualified it for being awesome. And it's just like, so we're throwing money and protections of money at communities. Well, that's gonna, it's also gonna affect community design. So here we are, flash forward. This was deemed illegal in 1968, the year before I was born. And still today, it's still spreading southward. So the snowball got pushed downhill. And it's just like, let's just talk about this. This isn't, these are choices that were made and it affects the shape of our city. It's not that this is the desirable part of town because the earth is better there. It's because of economic systems that were put in place that fertilized that soil. So that's, that's why we showed that map to them. And they, to their credit, they're just like, oh, that's cool. I mean, it's just they needed to have this conversation and this helped them wrap their brain around it so they can get past that bias. This is not easy stuff to talk about in a lot of communities. I, I, another book to recommend, um, Richard Rothstein's Color of Law. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And they came out with a second one. It's called Just Action that um, – has what, what can you do to to repair some of these indices? But in in a lot of communities, we have to first accept that this is a truth of what happened. So we sh- we show it to them. Um, but yeah, let's go back to the map for a second so you can see this again. So you see on the north side, here's downtown, here's the north downtown, and you can see it's pretty flat up there in value, and it's a lot hotter down here. This is this is definitely a new suburban area. And it's coming in hot because people pay more to live down there. But also think of the infrastructure from your job downtown or anywhere in the city to get all the way out there. So somebody has to pay for that system to go out there. Um, Well, and you're bringing up a really good point in making that comparison to a a hot area that is sort of a newer area in in that suburban context down there. there may be an impression or a belief that, oh, well, yeah, the, 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 it was really spiky and peaky there in, in Austin um, because there's so much new stuff you know, going in. There's so, so many new towers going in. But as you pointed out, that was a decade ago. I mean, it, it's probably even more pronounced now, a decade later, with the amount of growth. But I would suspect that, at least in the Austin, if we ran the numbers now, we might see some spikiness um, following uh, some of the the development uh, corridors and the transportation corridors and the TODs that are that are going in, where we are seeing a thickening of the housing stock and we're seeing oh, yeah. you know multi level um, you know multifamily uh, properties going in all along those areas as as also Austin like many other cities are trying to reverse the destructive land use codes, which has been, you know, that, that policy that continues to support the challenges that we have. Oh, oh sure. Yeah. I'll show you some of that. There, there's the, this, this is another way of looking at it. This is California. This is Rancho Cucamonga and California has a policy called prop 13 where you're taxed on the value of your house, but when it was depressed to, uh, it's like a 2% growth every year thereafter. So there's an incentive to stay in your house and not move. Um, it really shows up quickly here when you see new development versus old development. So this is an old suburban neighborhood over here. You can see how it's yellow and green. It's still a very wealthy part of the community up against the side of the mountain, which is this green pad over here. And that's like, it's, 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 it's the higher land. You get these great views. Well, over over on the over on the east side of town, this is a new development. So you see how it's coming in hotter. Well, it's the same. It's the same type stuff. It's you know, it's suburban development. It's not. This is the best year ever because it's brand new. Well, guess what? It's gonna it's gonna be trapped in amber and not grow because they adopted a policy that keeps it flat. Um, one of the things that actually since since you all saw our models, you'd see these purple mountains. Um, in in the in the in the downtowns, do you see one in this model? No, because they never grew up their downtown. This is just monolithically um, strip malls and single family housing. So they basically 
again, when we have community conversation, think about who shows up in the room. It's going to be people that live in houses and they have that biased perspective about what they want in their life. And the community is making a decision is do any of these people own a downtown building or even know what they do? So what ended up happening, we had to help explain that to them because yeah, these are choices. This is their downtown right now. It's about $400 million of value. If they let their downtown grow up at the rate that their suburbs are growing up and they just focused on that a little bit, their downtown would be worth $4 billion. So it's like, look, you made a choice to not, and the, the, the thing you mentioned, which is a lot of cases, mixed use buildings and walkable stuff, it's illegal because you need to have all these parking requirements, all this other buffers and all these other things that you shouldn't have in a downtown environment. You should have people need to, it's, it's, I mean, think about it whenever you walk around a city, a city that you go and pay money to go walk around in. And we all go, like we go to Europe or Boston or something like that. And we're like, look at how enjoyable this is. I can walk around and you end up walking like 10 miles because you're like, it's designed the way that people walk. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned that too, Joe, because I, that brings it home back to why we're having this discussion in the first place on the Active Towns channel is the fact that the way that we have been developing in a, you know, a horizontal expansion model, not only... Is it bankrupting us? But it also continues that that uh, downward spiral where we just don't have meaningful destinations within walking and biking distance, and that directly impacts active mobility and active transportation. Not to mention the fact that, as as Chuck points out, after we get through the life cycles of when the bills start coming due to try to support that stuff that's out on the fringes that's not able to pay for itself. Cities are literally going bankrupt. They do not have enough money to be able to have the nice things. In other words, continue reinvesting in, uh, you know, the sidewalks that are broken and the, you know, the pathways and trails and transforming our transportation system to be able to support, like we saw in, in the images there from the Netherlands, support active mobility. You know, you know, it's kind of comical to me is, um, you know, when I go to places in the in the Sun Belt, in the in the South, even Austin, and you know, I'll I'll talk with them about South Bend, Indiana, and what they did and what how they got themselves into a hole. So one of the things that happened in South Bend, let me kind of jump ahead to that one real quick. This I'm going to have to go into animation mode to see this okay. one. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you're bringing up South Bend, uh, Indiana, too. Um, of course, the, the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, is is Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg. Uh, so there's a little bit of context there as well. Yeah, no, he actually, he his team hired us in 20, 2016. And we went back in 2019 and did more work. But one of the things that we noticed, and I'm going to go full screen here, um, was their pipes. So on the, on the bottom left is their population growth. And you can see that them growing, their, their peak population year was 1963. And then they lost Studebaker and Packard to Detroit. Their population drops. And then they kind of flatline. They really, they, they basically have hovered around the same average population. On the right is their pipes going in the ground. And, and I'll drop a boundary when their population stops. But here you see the pipes growing out from the center outward. And you usually see this with streets and infrastructure. It all starts around your downtown kind of works its way out right about here is when their population stops so we show this to them we're like how is it you keep on building pipes when your population stops so what ends up happening is if you're adding more infrastructure but you're not adding more people you're putting more future costs on future landowners now as chuck points out in strong towns the cost of this infrastructure is usually borne by the developer and then they flip it over to the city and the city thinks it gets free infrastructure, but it's not free. You have to fix it over time. Right. You feel you feel, you feel it's a Ponzi, Ponzi scheme, you know, uh, you know, chasing wealth where the city feels kind of, you know, wealthy at the time because, oh, wow, we get the tax rolls now. To your point, though, it's it's a future obligation. Yeah. So this is this is what they had in 1960. This is a little blow up of downtown. And you can see two blocks of forced main forced. Force main are, are basically um, mechanic, uh, me mechanical uh, apparatuses that are pushed onto pipes to force the water or sewage through it. Lift stations are where you have to lift 
the the water or or sewage uphill. So these are the expensive things. Gravity feed is you put a pipe underground because it's if it flows downhill, it's easy. You just you work letting the earth work for you. The other thing to know about this from an environmental side is you typically need these things in low lying areas. So that's a signal that these are wetlands that they're building in. But if you look at it, it's just a couple areas by the river. Uh, okay, uh, this is what they were in 1960. Here's where they are now with their force mains and infrastructure, and here's their new boundary. So remember, they, they haven't added more people. So in 1960, they had 132,000 people, three lift stations, and a third of a mile of force main. Today, they're down to 103,000 people. So they've lost 22% of their population, yet gained 43 lift stations per person and 19 miles of force main. So a, a drop of population of 22%, a gain in infrastructure of 1,000 and 6,000%. So they have enough pipe to go from South Bend to Asheville to our office and this needs to be rebuilt every 50 or 60 years. So who's going to pay for that? And we just, I, sh I show that to um, folks in um, in like Austin. And I'm like, do you, do you think that people in South Bend sat around in 1961 and were like, someday we're going to suck? Of course yeah. not. <laughs> you know, so it's like, don't be, don't be foolish don't be, to think that yeah, you're don't doing the right thing right now. This. Yeah. 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 It's like yeah. stuff costs money. And it's I, I don't want to sound like, you know, like everybody's conservative uncle at the at the Thanksgiving uh, meal, but it's just like stuff costs money. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That It's something. And, you know, we, we've got um, your website back up here again. Uh, talk a little bit about uh for for your company and for anybody who's watching this or listening to this and they're they're going oh man we, we need our city to you know sort of look into this and and check this out um how does a, a an entity a municipality a city work with you all i mean oftentimes it just it's it starts with a conversation you know it depends on what they want to get into some and if if you watch some of the videos, and I, I recommend just pulling any of them offline. Um, there's there's the the cost side of things, like the what we had to do for the pipes in South Bend. Um, that's that takes a longer time to do. Um, the revenue side's usually easier. That's the first step. And we always we always say start with your revenue. One is it's easier. There, there's a cost side. That that's Eugene, Oregon. So in red, actually roll up back to that. Oh, this there one. you go. Oh. Yeah. In, in red is what's net negative in black is what's net positive. Uh, so okay. in the, so think of it this way, you choose to live further away. That's your choice. Knock yourself out, but there's a cost to doing that. And so if, if you move out there, we're going to send you a bill for your, for your lift station that it has to go through your pipe, your miles of pipe, Think, think of it this way, you know, John, it's like, it's kind of amazing. We talked about, we started this conversation about technology. So I've got this phone right here, right? Yeah. Don't you think Apple figured out the cost of the aluminum, the cost of the glass, the cost of all that before they sold me this phone? Absolutely. So why, why don't we yeah. do that with cities? Why do we sit here and have this conversation about value? Like what the hell does that matter? So we tax on this kind of really sloppy property tax system or whatever but it's just like, no, just think of it like a user fee. Like you want to choose to live way out on the north side of this community, good, go for it. One of the things about that north side, particularly on the west side of that river up there, a lot of that's wetlands. And so there's, it's really expensive because you're fighting mother nature. There's lots of lift stations and pumps and all that stuff. So notice how red it is. So we're like, there you go. That's your choice. The community needs to be aware that that's like one eighth of the population that lives in that area that we were subsidizing. Yeah. Not maybe not even one eighth, probably like a 32nd. And so is that the right choice for community subsidy? I don't care. It's your community, but maybe you need to build more of that stuff that's in the black. That's net positive to cover the cost of other stuff for folks that are listening to this, that live in a snow place, a place that snows. Think of it this way. If I live in a townhouse with 15 foot of frontage, right? I got a plow that goes by 15 feet. That's that's on a house. If I have a house with 250 feet of frontage, why am I paying the same rate for snow plow as somebody with a 15 footer? So right now we penalize the dense stuff. We penalize 
the downtown stuff is, is one way of looking at this image right here, right? It's overpaying in taxes. I think that should be a conversation. Right. Is that fair? You know, or you could say, do more black stuff to cover the subsidy of suburbia. You're right. So we, we can't tell people like you got to stop eating pizza, right? But you need to eat a salad every once in a while. You should exercise. So, you know, this is all back to behavioral health and how you would advise a, a client if you were a doctor. You might want to say you might want to stop smoking, but if you showed people a picture of their lungs that were riddled with with holes of emphysema that would probably get them to stop smoking. <laughs> Sometimes it won't because of the addiction. George Bush said that we have an addiction to oil. I don't think we have an addiction to oil. We have an addiction to a lifestyle choice that requires a lot of oil to make right. happen. Yeah, 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 exactly. And what's interesting too, when we look at, you know, in the black, you know, the, these are using the, the terminology of, of the financial ledgers. If you're if you're in the black, think of Black Friday. You know, you're 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 net positive here versus in the red, you're you're losing money. And what's really really interesting about this, especially like with Eugene, when you when you zoom in on that downtown area, many of these places that are you know so so to speak in the gray and in the black. Um, are some of the oldest parts of the city because they're near the downtown area. And to use, uh, you know, Chuck's terminology, oftentimes these are sort of like even blighted areas. Yeah. And so versus where the shiny and new is out is the stuff that's losing money. Actually, since you're on this, scroll up to the top of this map. Yeah. Just go north of, go north of downtown. Oh, um, just north of downtown, like right up here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right there. See oh. that little gray area that's kind of popping up. Yeah. That's a, that's that whole area. There is a little new urbanist development and all that stuff. All that stuff that's net positive are like two and three story buildings, you know, little townhouses and a little mixed use buildings. It's like, it's nothing. And that's part of what we're talking about with new urbanism oftentimes in, in talking about the need for us to come up with um, land use code reform to be able to build, you know, more housing within meaningful destinations and meaningful distances, doable distances, uh, walkable and bikeable distances to meaningful destinations is that thickening of the housing stock and, and, and also eliminating the zoning codes that are preventing us from having businesses back in our neighborhoods like we used to have in a traditional neighborhood. Yeah. Well, and it's also, it's just, I mean, let's just be real. It's like, we're think of it about it as a, as a, we're all at a grocery store. If you're pricing potato chips at five cents a bag and the carrots cost you $50 a stock, how's the consumer going to behave? You know, it's like probably not going to buy the potato, the, the carrots, you know, or, or somebody might, and so we, we've designed a world economically where we facilitated the choice to do the wrong thing. And so it's no surprise that we have obesity problems and because everybody's buying the potato chips. It's like, well, yeah, it's like one is they taste great. They're super awesome. We don't think about the consequences of long-term decisions. That's humans. Yeah. And, and, and you're really touching upon something that I talk about all the time on the channel here, which is behavior change. And when, when we are able to create communities where being able to have active mobility as a legitimate and practical and pragmatic choice, as humans, we're going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get in the car. I mean, that would be ridiculous. Just like when you were in Amsterdam there, it was like it was totally pragmatic to jump on the bike. I mean, why would you you know, try to call an Uber or rent a car, you wouldn't. It just doesn't make any sense at all, you know? And so it, it, being able to support healthier behaviors, again, impacting public health, um, oftentimes is saying, are we building our cities? Are we building active towns? Are we building strong towns uh, in a way that really reinforces that behavior that we'd like to see? I have a confessional to make, and since you brought it up. I remember back, God, it was probably 2001, I was doing a lecture in Vancouver and, you know, they fly me out there. But at the time I was like so used to living in Florida that I just assumed I needed to have a rental car. I needed like all this stuff. And they, I, they were so polite because they're Canadians and, and they're like, oh, all right. You know, you realize you can take the train. I was like, oh, I know. I just, I just, it just didn't dawn on me. 
Well, you may you may not have even had that uh, that that inclination. I mean, transit to somebody who doesn't normally take transit can be scary. Yeah, yeah. But then you know, it, and flash forward to Amsterdam, there was like seven bikes that we could that we could choose from that were just kind of sitting there at the at the at the hostel or their hotel, and um, they're just like, yeah, take one. And it was just like it was so easy, and they handed us a lock, and off we went. And you know, it's just the the world's has changed so much, and those areas that are ahead of the ahead of the game and have got put that forethought in are going to succeed. Uh, can I show you one more one more example? Yeah, yeah, quick? totally. Yeah, um, this is Indianapolis, Indiana. So this is Marion County. So we're talking Middle America here. Uh, when I'm talking Boston or San Francisco, so they've done two transit lines. So kind of zooming into the city, there's this this uh, red line that goes north south and the blue line that goes east west. We are working on the blue line, and we do this when we partner with like let's say we're working with a design team. We're working with a multi studio out of Kansas City with this one, and so the designers need to know what to do, but they also know that they're going to be changing zoning and doing this other stuff. We also know the resistance. One of the things that they were going to be recommending was things like getting rid of parking requirements. And when you walk into some communities and you recommend that, it's almost like people freak out, like the sky is going to fall if you recommend that. So how do you get people to get their brains around it? Well, one of the things you can see is the red line's already done and you can see the production that's going on here. There's a lot of hot stuff. These are all mi missing middle and infill buildings that are super potent. You can also see, even before their transit line on the blue line came in, you can see a little bit of a rash here, this one little purple pixie stick right there. That's infill that's going on that's highly productive. So there's a developer that's already figured this out. And chances are they're fighting the system to get this stuff built, but it's showing the productive value. And these are basically transit oriented cookie cutters that we went down the train line. Okay, so there's that. Stepping out for a second, I'm gonna go full screen on this one. Or actually this this is the city or Marion County. These are the buildings and these are the parking lots. So just to give them a raw, there's like basics of your how much fat tissue do you have versus muscle mass like what's your your basics here they've got as much land dedicated to roads as parking and then these are the buildings what people need to understand is money that comes back in this so you'll notice there's a lot of white space that's your backyards your buffers your farms your whatever financially so this is the physical environment of marion county we threw the water outside because the water you can't build in it so it's it's gone but roads, building, parking, this is everything else. Firms, buffers, backyards. Financially is the right square. Look at how much money you're getting out of the buildings versus park versus roads. So roads cost you money. You don't get any money from roads. Look at parking. So, okay, let's look at the left for a second. Parking and roads are the same area, pretty much. Look at the area financially. Why is parking so low a value? Right. So, right. When the car is moving around, we pay for it in these things called roads. When the car stops, we don't charge it the same amount. That's called a subsidy, right? Yeah, yeah. It's you're not paying the proper user fee. Secondly, look at the stuff that we love. Brooms, buffers, backyards, they take up the majority of our communities. They don't give us anything in taxes. Now, I don't want to be rude about it and say, you shouldn't have backyards. I just want you to know the financial consequences of that choice. You know, John, I could, I could say like, hey, I want to have a full head of hair. I think you should pay for it. Like what kind of nonsense is that? But this is what we do with our governments, okay? So, so back to the transit zone, this is the TOD cookie cutter. Let's kind of go ahead and hit play on this one. Let's drop downtown out because we don't care about that because this is all about transit going into downtown. This is the TOD. And so I'm presenting this to them. I'm like, you need to realize something for a second here. You probably don't remember countywide, but let's look at countywide. You actually have more land dedicated to parking in this transit corridor than you do countywide. That is insane. So in the middle of your city, you've wasted all this space. So, so here, to make it simple, this is Marion from Marion County right here. Here she is. She's got 1,200 square feet of buildings dedicated to her. So the average citizen has about that much building, this much road, and that much parking. When this gets built, this is the values of them. So the building's valued about 52 bucks, the parking 73 cents, 
and the road's going to cost you $22. It's going to cost you $22 in front of the building and $22 in front of the parking. So if you just think through this, I'm paying taxes on the building, I'm paying taxes on the parking. Parking's only paying one seventieth the taxes of that building, yet the cost is the same. So that's the differential. If we if we just just for the fun fun of it, we're like, let's just go ahead and put fifty percent of the taxes before it comes to the government into a savings account for the road to pay for the road in the future. How long will it take the building to pay off the road, and how long will it take the parking to pay off the road? And here's the numbers. 42 years versus 3,000 years. A road only lasts 50 years. So parking will never pay for the road in front of it. That's the, that's the weird irony of the system that we set up for cars. Like, what, uh, give me that for my bicycle or for, for a, a, a streetcar line or something like that. This is the subsidy that's out there. Just look, I don't care that this is there. Just make sure that you're aware of it. Secondly, these are the households in Marion County with no vehicles. So we're not talking to Amsterdam or Manhattan. There are people in, in Indianapolis that have no cars. These are households with one car, two cars, and three cars. So countywide, you're looking at 50% of the population have one car or less per household. When you look inside the transit corridor, it's 60%. So when not everybody has a car, why on God's green earth do we require two parking spaces per unit? And this is, this is the thing where we let our biases of who's in the room making decisions drive the choices because the people that make decisions on city council or on city staff, they probably have cars, right. you know? So this was a long way to get to a, a punchline, but this is, yeah, it's just like I want to just I want you to see how imbalanced the system is. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and it it immediately uh, brings to mind um, you know Don Shoup's classic book, The High Cost of Free Parking. It's just it, it's one of those things where until we actually this, this yeah. is a much thicker book though. I mean, this is yes, yes. Yes. I, I will say, I mean, it's it's not light reading. What does Jeff Speck say in Walkable Cities? This is a book that you can kill a small child with. I mean, it's right. it's it's big. It's 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 a classic now. You know, it's uh, nearly uh, nearly eight hundred pages long, um, and uh, but it gets to to the point that you just made is that it's insane the way that when you really dig into the finances of of parking, it's insane what we're doing with that. But yeah, yeah, and it's not. I mean, it's, it's not a conspiracy. It's just, it's how we've made decisions. And it's just kind of uh, sometimes, sometimes pretty, you would think it, like everything around it, the process of making the decision is sophisticated and adult. The actual data and choices behind that choice are unbelievably um, naive over the long haul. Well, and, 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 it's it's a challenge that we have and and it goes back to what we've grown up with what we've become accustomed to and then we start to have that uh sense of entitlement and expectations that go along with that and so much of that gets built into to this i really appreciate the work that you are doing and the work that chuck is doing um it it has really pushed me you know, from a public health perspective to also kind of look at the parallels and uh, and really see that we're all talking, you know, kind of the same language and we're, we're looking and we're actually trying to get to the same place um, because ultimately I want to see thriving, healthy communities and I want that health to be both physical health of, of the, the residents as well as fiscal health uh, of the communities. And so it's been such a joy and pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast for that reason. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for having me. And uh, sorry, sorry for the podcast to people. I'm a pictures guy, but you can watch the video later. Thanks for this. I appreciate it. This is fun. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Joe Minicosi. And if you did, please hey, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content that I'm creating here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. It's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org and click on the support button. Oh, and by the way, 
you can also click on the store button too. I've got uh, all sorts of cool swag out there. Streets are for people, uh, water bottles, coffee mugs, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all that good stuff. Hey, every little bit helps and helps support my efforts to keep this content coming to you. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.